This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for October 23rd through the 29th. On this week's show, we discuss a hostage ordeal during a musical that ended badly, a law that to this day has seriously annoying implications for everybody, and how a spitting incident led to a concept album breaking a long-held record. Unfortunately, there are times when politics and music intersect, especially when it comes to extreme violence and terrorist attacks. The May 22, 2017 terrorist attack at Manchester Arena in Manchester, England, after an Ariana Grande concert, the attack ended up killing 22 people. The November 13, 2015 terrorist attack at the Bataclan nightclub in Paris, France, that one killed 87 people. The October 7, 2023 terrorist attack at the Nova Music Festival in Israel, that one killed more than 380 people. Another event that happened in a theater started out as a terrorist attack and ended extremely terribly. In order to understand what happened this particular night, you have to understand what started the chain of events that led up to all of this. On August 7, 1999, Islamic fighters from the country of Chechnya went into the Dagestan region of Russia and declared it to be an Islamic state. Russia entered Chechnya on October 1st and ended their independence. Fighting went on for a few years, followed by an occupation. Meanwhile, back in Moscow, Russia, on October 23rd, 2002, people went about their evening as normal. Some people went to the Dubrovka Theater in order to see a musical called Nordost. Also on its way to that exact same theater was a bus. Only this bus had a group of people who could have cared less about the musical. Just after 9 p.m., between 40 to 50 Islamic terrorists, led by Moskar Barayev and Abu Bakar, entered the theater dressed in black and camouflage. The terrorists, who called themselves a suicide squad from the 29th Division, but were officially called the Special Purpose Islamic Regiment, or SPIR, SPEAR, took around 900 people hostage, including performers. Some performers in a part of the theater where they were taking a break managed to escape and call the police. The Chechnyan rebels said that their grudge was against Russia and not any other country and that they would release all foreign nationals provided that they could prove that they weren't from Russia by having a passport or some other form of ID. They then got down to business and made their demands. They wanted all Russian troops out of Chechnya, and they had to be out in seven days. They also wanted Russian troops to stop fighting the Chechnyans the very next day, and they also demanded that Russian President Vladimir Putin publicly say that he was trying to stop the Chechnyan war. The Russians said that they couldn't pull all of the troops out of Chechnya in a week. They did, however, stop some of their operations in Chechnya for a few days while the situation was tense. The official leaders of both pro- and anti-Moscow factions in Chechnya disavowed all knowledge of the splinter group. And that meant that this particular group of terrorists were on their own. No backup. The terrorists definitely did go in armed and ready. They had improvised explosive devices, landmines, and grenades. They put everybody into the auditorium. If people had to go to the bathroom, they had to use the orchestra pit. They played the usual games that terrorists play with the media. They had hostages talk to the media and the police, who by then had surrounded the theater, begging people not to storm into the auditorium. On the first day of the siege, the terrorists made good on their promise and released 200 people, mainly foreign nationals, children, and fellow Muslims. One woman who was not a hostage but was watching the events unfold on television decided to play Rambo and enter the theater on her own without the police. She was shot and killed by the terrorists after she got into the auditorium and started screaming for the hostages to stand up and attack their captors. 
by day two, the Russian government offered to let the terrorists get out alive, provided that all of the hostages were released. Negotiations continued with various government spokespeople and a few more hostages being released. A hot water pipe burst and flooded one of the floors to the theater. The terrorists thought that the burst pipe was done by the government. Turns out the terrorists may have been right because Russian special forces had been using that pipe as a listening device. Day three had further negotiations with the terrorists and a couple of deaths. Yet another person thought that he was Sam Fisher from Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell and got into the theater. He said that one of his sons was a hostage. He was also shot by the terrorist. A hostage tried to attack some terrorists thinking that he could take them because this particular group of terrorists were female and therefore weaker than him. I guess he forgot that terrorists, both male and female, are usually trained especially if they're a trained military unit. And, of course, in the ensuing firefight, three hostages, including the man who thought that women were weaker than him, were killed. Overnight, on day four, everything came to a boil. First, word leaked that special envoys were going to come in the morning to continue negotiations. Then, word leaked to the terrorists that Russian special forces were going to storm the theater at 3 o'clock in the morning. The special forces units, the Spetsnaz, staged a fake raid in order to catch the terrorists off guard. Some terrorists threw grenades, seriously wounding some troops. But then, once the terrorists realized that there was no actual raid, they relaxed, which is exactly what the Spetsnaz wanted. It was time to start the real attack. The plan was simple enough. It was determined that there were too many terrorists to do a traditional Call of Duty style raid. The plan was to first pump in knockout gas and then storm the theater. At 5 a.m., the gas started to get pumped in, either through the ventilation unit or holes in the building. Some terrorists had planned for a chemical attack and had gas masks. Those terrorists started shooting towards the Russian troops outside. After 30 minutes, the special forces stormed the theater. Small firefights erupted, but eventually, two hours after the raid began, all of the terrorists were killed. The Spetsnaz claimed victory, and then the bodies began to be removed. At first, the government claimed that whichever hostages had been killed in the raid were killed by the terrorists. They announced that 67 hostages had been killed, but wouldn't say where the hostages, either dead or alive, had actually been taken. By the end of the day, the government upped the number of dead hostages to 118. Rumors started to swirl around that certain hostages weren't being treated because they had Chechnyan-sounded names. The official casualty report said 40 terrorists and 130 hostages were killed. After the usual excuse-making for the raid, which was officially blamed on the terrorists executing the hostages, and for some of the deaths being blamed on poor health conditions, it soon came out that the level of gas that was poured into the theater may have been lethal. About 700 people were poisoned by whatever gas was actually being used during the raid. According to the testimony from the inquiry into the raid, most of the deaths were caused by the suffocation from the gas, the exact gas never being officially announced, but court inquiries suspect that either it was fentanyl or methyl fentanyl. What resulted from the raid was a tougher stance against the country of Chechnya. Some Russian forces were going to be pulled out of Chechnya, but instead, more troops went in even harder this time, and soon, operations began to get anyone who was suspected in helping out the raid. The Chechnyan president offered peace talks, but that offer fell on some very deaf ears. Russia carried out a retaliatory operation that some said bordered on human rights abuses. In Russia, a news organization that was critical of the raid found itself under new management that was a little bit more obedient to the government, shall we say. 
what was absolutely clear was that a musical event was used as a staging ground to elicit terrorist fear, and it all ended horribly wrong for everyone on all sides. The four-day siege of Moscow's Dubrovka Theater during a performance of the musical Nordost, October 23rd through October 26th, 2002. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. If you have ever gotten a takedown notice from YouTube or anyone else because you've used a song as background, or in the case of some travel videos that I watch, a song happens to be playing in someone's car as it's passing, then this story is most likely the reason why. It concerns a piece of legislation that was signed into law on October 28, 1998. Back in the Wild West days of the Internet, i.e. the 1990s, old media companies were afraid of the Internet and fought like hell against it. TV and movie companies refused to put videos online because they were afraid that people would steal them. The only major video players where you might watch something online were AOL and RealPlayer. The old media companies fought so hard against it that they lobbied hard for, and eventually got passed, a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or the DMCA. This law made it possible for companies to issue those takedown notices to individuals and to sue them or have them kicked off of services for continued abuses. In the law was buried a line called the Safe Harbor Line. It protected companies from lawsuits if they were using user-created content. This part of the law has been used by more than a few companies. Napster tried to defend itself from lawsuits using this part and lost, while YouTube used the law to protect itself and won. This law, while it does legitimately protect creatives from people and companies who are blatantly ripping them off, has also been taken to the extreme. For instance, Universal Music Group sued a housewife and also YouTube because the woman had the song Let's Go Crazy by Prince barely playing in the background of a YouTube video of her kid. It's that kind of abuse that the law needed to fix. Will it ever get fixed? Who knows? There is a new law that just got put into place only about five years or so ago. With all the media that's out there these days, there's always going to be people trying to abuse the law. I can easily understand a creative or a company being angry if someone continuously puts items up on sites in order to make money off of it, like, say, a fashion company using someone's song without paying them for the use, and then throwing it up on Instagram or YouTube or wherever. However, going after an individual who's not making money off of doing a parody video of a song or is using the song as part of their Instagram video smacks of greed, actually, and that is where the law has its problems. It's also why I don't use people's songs in my podcasts or even photos when I put podcasts up like this one on YouTube because I don't have time for the legal hassle. Plus, I get why photographers and videographers don't like having their work used for things other than what they say it can be used for. In any event, every time you get a takedown notice from YouTube or anyone else, remember that you have this very outdated law to thank for it. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act, signed into law by President Bill Clinton on October 28, 1998.
What if I told you that a now-famous Broadway show got popular because of an album? You would say, sure, that happens all the time. Green Day and American Idiot, for example. True, but shows like that were adapted only after the album, American Idiot, movie, insert any Disney movie in that slot, or songbook, Billy Joel, Motown, Carole King, etc., ended up becoming popular. This next story is about how a Broadway show became popular because it was purposely marketed as an album first. See, back in the late 1960s, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice had a show called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It wasn't too popular at the time, mainly playing in churches over in England. Undeterred, though, they decided to work on what would be their third musical with an uncontroversial subject matter that people would flock to like crazy Jesus Christ. Yep, no controversy there. And just to kick that up a notch, they concentrated the story on Judas. And to kick that up a notch even further, they decided not to portray Judas as a villainous backstabber, but as someone who was bothered with the fact that Jesus had a massive following and became a celebrity, or as is more widely known, uh, a messiah complex. Which, okay, he was, but whatever. Still, that shouldn't stop anybody from backing this new venture, should it? After all, it is the 1960s, free love, hippies, and all that, you know. Surely people would fork over money for this. Yeah, um, no. Financial backers were shockingly, not shockingly, not ready yet to fork over millions for this idea. Andrew and Tim were stuck. How could they get people to back this? And then they got an idea. How about they put out the cast concept album first just to whet everybody's appetite? Maybe that'll get them interested. Andrew and Tim gathered up a cast that included some people who would later become famous. For instance, singer Helen Reddy, who would go on to have a huge hit with the song I Am Woman. Murray Head, who had the hit One Night in Bangkok. And Yvonne Elliman, who sang, of course, If I Can't Have You, from the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. They all recorded this album in September of 1969. And then on September 10th, 1970 in England and October 27th, 1970 in America, they released their album. The reaction, as you would expect from virtually anything that Weber and Rice has ever done, was not met kindly by the critics. They trashed it. The BBC, for its part, banned the album, calling it sacrilegious. Didn't matter. The album did its job. It became a huge smash and got the public excited for the Broadway show, which by then had found financial backing. Just goes to show you that sometimes you got to bet on yourself and your dreams and come up with a different way in order to get your dreams accomplished. The Jesus Christ Superstar Concept Album, released in America on October 27, 1970. This next story is about how spitting on someone can turn into a record-breaking concept album. Back in 1977, Pink Floyd was playing their first stadium tour, and they were hating it. In fact, at one show in Montreal, Canada, Roger Waters thought that a group of fans had gotten so out of control that he spit on them. Adding to the band's woes was the fact that the band's financial management team had made a lot of risky investments that had failed, potentially leaving the band with a huge tax bill. On top of all of that, the record label Columbia Records wanted a new album much sooner rather than later. The band felt isolated. All of those troubles, along with marital problems with different members of the band, left the band in a bad emotional and financial spot. During a little time off, Roger Waters came up with two concept ideas. One idea was about marriage, fidelity, and the like. That album became the basis for Waters' future solo album, The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. 
The other concept was a 26-song opus about Waters, his childhood, and the isolation that had been built up at that time. That was the one the band went with, although they changed the main character from Waters to a guy named Pink. From the beginning, the album had problems. The guys weren't getting along, for instance. Their producer, Bob Isrin, was constantly late and going through marital problems of his own. The band also had to move out of England in order to escape those pesky taxes. And that led to even more family problems. Things got so bad that the band had to fire their keyboardist, Rick Wright, right in the middle of recording the album, although they kept him on as a salaried performer for the remainder of the album and the tour. Boy, that had to grind at him. Also, Columbia tried to do two things to the band. The first was they tried to get Waters to agree to a smaller cut of the publishing rights because it was a double album, doing more work for less money, I guess. The other was to get the release date for the album pushed up. Waters said no to both of those ideas. He eventually won on both of them. Finally, the album was ready. They played it for the label, who mainly hated it, but decided to release it anyway because they needed to put out something. This album was released on November 30th, 1979, to mixed reviews. Now, right about now, you're asking yourself, why in the world am I even talking about this album now when it came out in November and we're dealing with a podcast about October 23rd through the 29th? Well... Here is why. This album that the record label and some critics hated would go on to sell 23 million records and be called one of the greatest albums ever recorded. It would also stay on Billboard's top albums chart for what seemed like forever. In fact, on October 27, 1983, the album broke the record for consecutive weeks spent on Billboard's Top 200 Albums chart when it hit 491 consecutive weeks. Its final total would end up being 724 weeks. Consecutively, that is. The album, whose record Pink Floyd broke, by the way, was Johnny Mathis's Greatest Hits. Pink Floyd's double album, The Wall, broke Billboard's consecutive weeks on the top album's chart record on October 27th, 1983. And that is it for the Music History Today in-depth podcast for October 23rd through the 29th. Thank you very, very much for listening and or watching if you're on YouTube or Spotify. 